Hi, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to talk to you about ocean acidification. And I'm going to start um, with this slide of an oyster grower to bring up a bunch of the themes that I'm going to talk about today. So the first is the interaction between a farmer and the species that he farms, these interactions between humans and wild resources, or farmed resources. Also, I'll talk about the influence of um, marine chemistry on populations, the interactions between the atmosphere and the marine, marine system. And then also I'll talk about how humans are impacting the atmosphere. So a bunch of different themes to explain this fairly complex issue of ocean acidification and how it's going to impact potentially uh, people in Washington state. So ocean acidification is basically the world's largest chemistry experiment that we as humans are doing without most of us actually realizing it. So ocean acidification is an increase in ocean acidity due to increased atmospheric carbon dioxide. Most people don't think about this, but what we put into the air, into the atmosphere, interacts with the ocean over the majority of the world's surface. So these gases are infiltrating and invading into the ocean. So this shows you a graph of CO2, carbon dioxide, in the atmosphere over time. And what we have on the y-axis is CO2. Oops, let's see. CO2, and on the x-axis we have years. So this, this number will look familiar. These numbers are uh, thousands of years before the common era. So what you can see is that carbon dioxide does naturally uh, increase and decrease over time. But in our modern age, carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere are skyrocketing. These concentrations are due to humans burning of fossil fuels and released into the atmosphere. We can actually see the chemical fingerprint of fossil fuels in this carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and we can also see the chemical uh, signature, this fingerprint of fossil fuels in carbon dioxide invading into the oceans. Okay, and this change is happening very quickly. So I've talked about how carbon dioxide, this gas, is causing a change in acidity. Well, how does that actually happen? It turns out that carbon dioxide is what we call an acid gas. When carbon dioxide dissolves into water, it breaks the water molecules apart and forms carbonic acid. Okay? This carbonic acid then itself dissociates into one of three ions, hydrogen ions, carbonate ions, or bicarbonate ions. Okay, so as CO2 increases, it forms an acid, and hydrogen ions increase. Hydrogen ions is what we measure when we talk about acidity. That's what acidity is. It's the concentration of hydrogen ions. Okay? The way that we measure this concentration is with the pH scale, which I have here. And the pH scale is what we call a log scale. So in a normal, when you count normally, you count 1, 2, 3. But when you count on a log scale, you count 1, 10, 100. So small differences in the pH of a liquid have big differences in the concentration of hydrogen ions. Okay, so the pH of our world's oceans right now is at about 8.1. Over the course of the industrial era, the pH of the oceans has dropped 0.1 of a pH unit. While this doesn't sound very, like very much, it's actually a 30% increase in the concentration of hydrogen ions in the ocean over the past 250 years. Okay, very big change. So uh, I don't want you to have to take my word for it that uh, carbon dioxide forms an acid in water, so I'm going to show you. If you bear with me, here we have a bottle of seawater, and to this seawater I've added um, a dye. And the dye is blue when pH is higher, and then it turns yellow as pH decreases. And so what I'm going to do is try not to spill. And what I have here is a cartridge of CO2. This is what people use to uh, refill their bike tires when they get flat. And what I'm going to do is I'll put this stream of CO2 into the water, and we'll see if it changes color. So what I've shown you here is that just by adding some CO2 into seawater, I've changed its chemistry. I've decreased the acidity of it. Or sorry, increased the acidity. Uh, in, sorry, decreased the acidity, increased the hydrogen ions. And I bring this up because it's a very complex thing to go over the pH and the acidity going in opposite directions. OK. So I've talked to you about how carbon dioxide is an acid gas. I've showed you that CO2 can decrease uh, pH. 
But let's look at data from the real world. So what, these are data collected off of Hawaii, um, or on Hawaii, right there. So one time series is here on Mauna Loa, and the other is the Hawaii Ocean Time Series. What you can see on the first uh, y-axis right here is carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide has increased in Mauna Loa over time. What's really interesting is you can see a parallel increase in the amount of carbon dioxide dissolved into seawater right off of Hawaii. And this green line here indicates the pH of the ocean water dropping as the carbon dioxide in it increases. So what we predict for the future, if uh, carbon emissions continue as we expect they will, that ocean acidity could increase by 100 to 150 percent by the year 2100. Okay, it's a very big change in chemistry over a relatively short period of time. This rate of change is 10 times faster than anything that the Earth's oceans have experienced in the past 50 million years. Okay, the ocean's acidity right now uh, is the last time it was this low was the dawn of modern horses. Okay, the last, the, uh, last time that pH will be as low as we expect it will be in year 2100 was when T-Rex was on the Earth. And so these really rapid changes in the environment make us concerned about the fate of marine species and whether they'll be able to adapt to these changes in chemistry rapidly enough to persist. So I've talked to you a lot about global patterns. Well, I'm supposed to be talking about Washington State. Let's think about how Washington State and the Pacific Northwest might be impacted by acidification. It turns out that uh, because where we sit in the circulation of the world's oceans, that our ocean waters are actually naturally pretty acidic around here compared to other places around the world. So there are three spots in the world where ocean acidification is occurring very rapidly. Here, the Southern Ocean off of Antarctic, the Antarctic, and uh, up in the High Arctic. So we're at one of the three hot spots for the progression of ocean acidification and being low pH. In addition, because we sit on the um, east coast of an ocean basin, we have upwelling events. Okay, so when northerly winds combine with the rotations of the Earth, seawater is actually pushed off the coast out towards the open ocean, and we have upwelling that occurs. So we have water that's very cold, high in, naturally high in carbon dioxide, coming up to the surface. These cold, uh, upwelled waters are high in CO2 because, first of all, they're cold. You know this from practice. When you take a soda out of the fridge and you leave it on the counter, it starts bubbling a lot, right? So the increase in temperature of this liquid is making it less able to hold carbon dioxide. So you see those carbon dioxide bubbles coming off. Okay, so this cold, old, deep water has a lot of CO2. So that's one of the reasons why the Pacific Northwest is especially vulnerable to acidification. We, we expect there are going to be an increase in uh, the duration and magnitude of upwelling events, and then this water will also be, uh, have more carbon dioxide, more hydrogen, lower pH. This is because this water will have also picked up the signature of ocean acidification from accumulating carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. All right, so these upwell wa waters also invade into Puget Sound. And there, there's a lot of interaction between humans and land use and the ocean chemistry. Okay, so there's some natural processes that decrease the pH in Puget Sound, but also human actions can decrease the pH of the waters in Puget Sound. So for example, um, when we release a lot of nutrients off of the <coughs> land and they run into the water, that can often cause phytoplankton blooms. Well, you think that would be a good thing, except these big blooms then die, bacteria come in and eat them, and bacteria turn oxygen into carbon dioxide. So along with eutrophication events that are caused by nutrient runoff, we also get acidification events. So now let's move on to the biology. This is actually the canary in the coal mine for the Pacific Northwest, an oyster. And uh, so the oyster industry is what really um, brought the world's attention about ocean acidification to the Pacific Northwest. What these oyster growers found was that in the mid-2000s, they were having a lot of trouble producing oysters in their hatcheries. They would do the spawns of the oysters, and the larvae just wouldn't live. 
uh, individuals who were harvesting oysters in Willapa Bay found that the oysters weren't naturally reproducing there at a, at a magnitude high enough to support commercial harvest. So at first, the uh, shellfish industry thought that this was caused by a disease. But then they started working with oceanographers and realized that this failure in the hatchery production of oysters was actually due to ocean chemistry. And working with scientists, um, they were able to figure out that oyster production decreased when the pH of the waters was really low and growth decreased as well. Okay, so they linked these changes in the hatchery, these changes in, in aquaculture to ocean acidification. So this gives you an image of what was happening in these, in, uh, in these hatcheries. So on the left here, we have an oyster as it's supposed to grow. This is, you can see at the top when an oyster is one day old and the bottom when it's four days old. And these are living in low CO2 waters, waters that you would expect on the surface without much invasion of CO2. Okay, over here, these are oysters of the same age that were raised in high CO2 conditions. Okay, these conditions are also found in Puget Sound, naturally, but these low pH conditions are enhanced by ocean acidification. Okay, and what you can see is these guys aren't growing as much and they're deformed. So all of these arrows are pointing towards deformities. So why is this oyster having trouble growing? Well, I talked a lot about how invasion of carbon dioxide into the water increases hydrogen ions, and I also mentioned that it decreases carbonate ions. Well, it turns out these baby oysters are growing calcium carbonate shells. Okay, usually we think about a shell looking like this. This is calcium carbonate. This is calcium carbonate in its crystalline form. These, these tiny little crystals is what, well, a collection of tiny little crystals is what makes up a shell. So as ocean acidification increases, carbonate ions decrease, it is harder for these young animals to form their shells. It takes more energy. They're fighting against these chemical gradients. And that's what's causing a lot of the problems for these developing uh, individuals. Well, what about something beyond just um, oysters? This is a picture of a pteropod, or a series of pictures of pteropods. Pteropods are small uh, marine snails that have turned their foot into wings. So they actually fly through the water column instead of sitting on the, on the, on the ground. And these guys are really important in marine food webs. They serve as a big uh, food source for fish and seabirds. Well, this shows you a pteropod shell as it's supposed to look. And over the four course of 45 days, this uh, shell was incubated in water that resembles uh, water conditions we expect in year 2100. And what you can see is the dissolution of this shell around the animal, OK? And I've replicated this in our lab to see that local pteropods actually have the shell dissolve around them when they're put into acidified waters that we expect in the future. So I've mentioned two species that are impacted by acidification because of their shell, but ocean acidification is likely to cause a variety of impacts to marine organisms. Uh, changes in respiration, growth, development, and behavior. Some of these uh, changes are, or these responses are expected. Uh, for example, we expect that seagrasses will be fertilized by carbon dioxide, or that some phytoplankton might be fertilized by uh, extra carbon dioxide, but the repercussions of these changes can be unexpected. For example, this is a harmful algal bloom species. In acidified oceans, or oceans that we expect under ocean acidification, uh, these uh, harmful algal blooms actually bloom much more rapidly and produce more toxins. And there are other surprises that happen as well. For example, some reef fish in Australia, turns out that ocean acidification will impact or in the, in the laboratory, impacts the neuro, their neurotransmitters. So they don't behave properly. They actually swim into the mouths of their predators, and they can't find the cues to find the proper habitat. So there are a lot of ways that species can be directly impacted by acidification. But as an ecologist, it's important for me to emphasize that species will also be indirectly impacted by acidification. So while I don't expect this orca up here to be directly affected by these changes in chemistry, if their prey species or the prey of their prey species is impacted by acidification, that could have big implications for marine food webs. 
And it's not that every species has to be directly impacted by acidification, just one or two very key species are impacted that could alter the food web as well. So this shows you um, a natural experiment of what a high CO2 world might look like. This is two pictures taken fairly close to each other off the island of Ischia in Italy. And on the left you can see uh, normal chemistry water. And you can see the organisms living in there. There are a lot of calcifiers, these urchins, these pink uh, crustos coralline algae and a fairly diverse ecosystem. Over here what you see is what we call a champagne site. So this site is close to the volcano of Mount Vesuvius. The volcano is still very active and the volcano causes this bubbling of CO2 through the water column. So this is a natural experiment of what a high CO2, CO2 world looks like. There's a lot of life there, but it's a very different community where a lot of the primary producers, the algae are benefiting and a lot of the calcifiers uh, aren't able to persist. So let's bring it back to Washington and think about how Washington interacts with marine resources. Well, we know the shellfish aquaculture industry is very important. Uh, it produces uh, 3,200 jobs, often in uh, coastal communities with low employment opportunities. It's worth $270 million a year. Recreational shellfishing itself is, is worth $27 million a year. If we think about the broader marine community, um, the Wild, wild seafood industry um, brings in, I think, 1.7 billion to the uh, gross state product and employs 42,000 people. Okay, within this uh, tribal harvest of just gooey ducks earns about 32 million dollars a year. So there's a lot of economic benefit to keeping marine resources healthy, but there's actually a lot of cultural benefit as well to the native tribes of Washington and others who live there. For example, those who visit Pike's Place Market or experience the joy of um, engaging in these harvests, the recreational harvests. So recognizing the uh, place of marine resources in Washington's community and the unique chemistry of, of our area, our reliance on shellfish, shellfish aquaculture as well, Governor Gregoire took a really unique step. She took in these facts and she said, well, what can Washington do about ocean acidification, this global problem? And she said, we can lead. And so what she did last year around this time was um, start a blue ribbon panel on ocean acidification. She got together 28 individuals from a wide spectrum of places, so local, state, federal, tribal uh, government members, people from nonprofit institutions, uh, industry representatives from the shellfish industry, forestry industry, and then also scientists like me, and brought us all together in a room and said, okay, figure out what the state of the science is of an ocean acidification, what it means to Washington, and then think about how we can act, what we can do. So we came up with two uh, reports from this. One is a state of the a scientific summary of what is known about ocean acidification in Washington and its impacts. And the second is a series of recommendations on how Washington can deal with ocean acidification. We uh, lumped our recommendations into six main themes, and I'll go over those main themes with you. The first is to reduce carbon dioxide emissions, and do that by actions in Washington, and also talking to our trading partners, talking to the regional community about the impacts of acidification on Washington and what that means to us as a state. Uh, also, reduce local land-derived uh, contributions to acidification, so these nutrients that run off the land and can cause acidification events. Nutrients can come from land use changes, like development, uh, can come from forestry, agriculture, urban areas, so there's a variety of places where nutrients can come from and what we need to do is figure out how uh, local areas are impacted by nutrients. This third here is um, the we suggested that people look to ways to adapt and remediate the impacts of acidification in Washington. So uh, helping the shellfish industry adapt to these changes in chemistry, looking for places in the wild that might be a refugia for ocean acidification. On the bottom, we suggested that uh, Washington invest in research and monitoring to understand the, how ocean acidification is progressing and then the impacts that might have 
and also to explore in the laboratory which species are likely to be most susceptible to acidification. We also recommended that, um, the, that Washington engage and educate and inform local stakeholders, um, people from who are decision makers, and the general public about ocean acidification so that this issue is, uh, is people are very aware of it in Washington state. And then finally, that gets to my last point, the last theme of recommendations was a recommendation that government at all levels consider ocean acidification in a coordinated and sustainable way. So I'll end my talk with a quote from Dr. Lipchenko, who's the head of NOAA. And she said that nowhere on our planet is a local response to ocean acidification more urgently and immediately needed than here in Washington state. And what's exciting is that although the uh, impacts of acidification are likely to be large on Washington state, um, and the fact that we are actually experiencing the impacts of ocean acidification now, Washington is a real leader globally and nationally in dealing with ocean acidification from a policy point of view and a community point of view. Thank you. <laughs>